Hi, I'm Tom Marks with the Marks Law Firm. Welcome to the Healthy Family Law Attorney YouTube channel. Your family matters, and my purpose is to provide hope and help to your family to help you get through the family law process, whether it's divorce or paternity, custody battle or whatever, and to hopefully do it in a healthy way. So today we're gonna to talk about custody battles. And if you've seen some of my prior videos about collaborative law, that would obviously be a better way to go to avoid a custody battle. But if you find yourself having to deal with this, Let's look at chapter 61.13, which provides all of the factors in a custody case. These are the factors that the court must consider and must include in the final judgment or in the order, whether it's a permanent or a temporary order that provides the reasoning the court went through in order to arrive at a decision. So let's dive in. The first factor under the statute, and there are 20 factors total. <clears throat> I'm gonna make this a four part series, five factors in each of the different YouTube videos so we can get into the depth of each um, section of the statute. So let's begin, let's go. Um, number one, the demonstrated capacity and disposition of each parent to facilitate and encourage a close and continuing parent-child relationship, to honor the time-sharing schedule, and to be reasonable when changes are required. So this is the first, and I think probably the most important of the factors, although all of them have to be taken into consideration by the court. So let's look at it the parent more likely to facilitate and encourage a close and continuing parent-child relationship. So what does that mean? Uh, the court's gonna look at testimony of the parties, but it's typically a he said, she said scenario. So how does the court know? One of the things I would suggest to you is emails and texts are extremely important. So let's say you're having a dispute with your spouse uh, during the divorce or even leading up to it about the children and your, your significant other or spouse says, I don't really care about your relationship with the kids or says something that gives the court an indication that th that person is not going to help facilitate or encourage um, a close relationship between you and the children. So that will be taken against, that will be uh, a significant factor against uh, awarding, when I say custody, that's really a term no longer in the statute. So let me just say, the statute is talking about time sharing or contact time, basically overnights uh between the parent and the child or children so the court's looking at what amount of time um for a lot of different reasons it can be it's going to impact uh child support number one the more time with one parent could lead to uh, a higher child support amount or less child support being paid if it's the, the payor parent that is um, exercising more of the time sharing. So uh, be careful when you're communicating with your spouse about their relationship with the children. You want to encourage that relationship. You want the judge to see that. And so that'll count in your favor. Also, what about the time sharing schedule? So let's say you have um, an agreed schedule or you have a temporary schedule leading up to the final hearing that splits the week in, in half, or let's say uh, three days, one week with you, three overnights really, um, and then four overnights with you the next week. Well, if your uh, significant other or spouse is interfering with that time sharing, either they're showing up late for uh, pickups or drop-offs, or they're making some excuse that they can't, um, 
deliver the children or the children need to stay with them an extra night or they're just being completely inflexible and not uh, working with you on the time sharing, the, um, then that will be counted against that parent. So you want to be perceived by the court. And so you want to, in reality, in actuality, encouraging the relationship between the children and the other parent, you're going to be abiding by the time sharing schedule that's been put in place. And then third, you're going to be flexible regarding changes to the time sharing. So let's say uh, your, your, your spouse has um, uh, a family gathering or a birthday party of a close family member and they want the children to be with them even though it's not their day of the week um, with the children. If you are not flexible and willing to change, you don't have anything else really going on with the kids that is nearly as important, uh, then the court's going to look at that as, okay, this is a parent that's not really going to be encouraging or changing or being flexible with the other parent. So that's factor number one, that capacity and that disposition to encourage that uh, relationship with the other parent to abide by the time sharing schedule and to be flexible with changes. Let's go to number two. The second factor that the court must consider is the anticipated division of parental responsibilities after the litigation, including the extent to which the uh, parental responsibilities will be delegated to third parties. Okay, so this is an interesting one because think about it. How does the court really know what you're gonna do after the litigation? So the court's gonna have to make some very uh, significant findings and gonna have to almost um, engage in kind of the wisdom of Solomon um, and determine from the testimony of the parties and other significant um, witnesses in the case, determine which of the parties you, they think after the case are going to really be taking care of the children and, and dividing up the responsibilities. So that's like um, attending parent-teacher conferences, um, making sure homework is done. So let's say um, leading up to the divorce, the kids, when they're ever at your, your house, um, the homework's not getting done. So when the children get returned to the other parent, that other parent then has to scramble to get the homework finished or the assignment finished for the next day at school. That testimony will come out. Uh, the teacher may come in and testify uh, regarding that. And the court will say, well, the kids were with uh, the mother or father that night before the test or before the homework assignment was done and it wasn't done. So that will be um, counted against you. Also, whether you're going to be handing off a lot of these responsibilities to third parties. So are you going to have uh, grandparents, uh, brothers, sisters, neighbors picking up, dropping off the children or taking them to extracurricular activities or whatever. The court wants the parents to be the primary um, drivers of what goes on in the children's lives. They want the parents to be the ones who are intimately involved, not handing it off to third parties. So that's factor number two that the court's gonna consider in a custody case. Number three, the demonstrated capacity and disposition of each parent to determine, consider, and act upon the needs of the child as opposed to the needs of the parent. Okay, so this is fairly straightforward. Um, is the parent making sacrifices for the welfare of the children or is the parent doing their own thing and going out when they should be helping the kids with homework or um, going on vacation and dropping the kids off uh, at someone else's house, a third party, family member, neighbor, um, or even the, the other party. Um, so are you gonna put your needs ahead of the children or are you gonna put the children's needs ahead of your own? 
that will be a significant factor for the court. I think judges are human beings. Most judges are parents and they will look at that and that will weigh heavily in their decision as to who's going to get how much time sharing, how much uh, contact. This is all going to be put into the parenting plan that the court's going to put together. If you haven't been able to do it uh, yourself, I'll probably do a separate video on uh, parenting plans because they're very detailed um, or they should be. Um, I see too many parenting plans that are are just um, not detailed. Um, and when it comes to later on um, having um, making a decision about what the parenting plan says, if it doesn't have enough detail, then the parents are likely going to have additional conflict and maybe be back in court. Um, I can give examples of that when I do the, um, the video on the parenting plan. So the next factor, number four, is the length of time the child has lived in a stable, satisfactory environment and the desirability of maintaining continuity. Okay, this is uh, a situation I, I see quite a bit where Clients come to me and go, um, should I move out, move into an apartment um, and um, just kind of set up my own place? It's kind of difficult staying in the home with my spouse. Well, the problem with that is the judge may say, well, the kids have lived in the marital home for t 10 years and um, it's in a good neighborhood and good schools and the court wants the kids maybe to stay in that stability and in that environment. If your apartment is in another school district, um, there's gonna be a problem uh, getting the kids to school on time. Maybe um, your new place is not in a desirable neighborhood. The court might take that into consideration for the welfare of the minor children. I should say that the overriding factor in all of this is what is in the best interest of the minor children? The court is going to look at that as the primary consideration. These are all sub factors to help the court make the ultimate decision of what is in the best interest of the minor children. Which parent should the children live with primarily? Uh, you may hear that people say that, well, there's this presumption that it's a 50 50 uh, time sharing. Um, arrangement or that the court will start with that as uh, the st that will be the starting place. And that's, that is not true. That is not the way it's supposed to be. The statute clearly says there's no presumption in favor of starting point of 50-50 time sharing. The court is supposed to look at these factors, A through T, which is these 20 factors we're going to be talking about in these four videos. And that's why you need to be clearly aware of what you, if you're doing this on your own or with your attorney, what you need to prove to the court. Okay, let's get into the fifth and final factor that the court must consider in a time sharing case or in a custody case as it's traditionally called. Um, that term is, custody is no longer in the statute. Um, so, but people still use that term and it's, it's commonly understood what we're talking about. So number five, the geographic viability of the parenting plan with special attention paid to the needs of school age children and the amount of time to be spent traveling to effectuate the parenting plan. This factor does not create a presumption for or against relocation of either parent with a child. Okay, geographical viability, uh, travel time. So obviously the kids are paramount. That's what we've got to consider. So if one parent moves halfway across town or all the way across town, and it's gonna be a real problem when the kids are with that other parent to get them into their school or get, to, get them to school on time in the morning, then that's gonna weigh against awarding weekday time sharing with that parent. If you want to have more than just weekends with your kids, then you need to consider relocating or 
it's really not technically a relocation, but you need to uh, consider locating your new residence perhaps within the same school district or close by so it will help facilitate the travel uh, time for the kids to and from school so that's really important these five factors are going to be critical we're going to get into factors 6 through 10 in the next video and then 11 through 15 and finally 16 through 20 so you'll have a complete review of all of the factors before I leave, I wanna give you a healthy living tip because I think families going through this process, especially if you're gonna have a custody battle, very stressful. I think it's really important. Something I would encourage people to do is make sure they get good amount of sleep. Too many people um, are anxious and worried and they don't get enough sleep during the process. It wears them down and your health is important. So. Tip number one, make sure your room is as dark as possible and as quiet as possible. We all have these electronic devices in our room. We have clocks, we have TVs, electronics, your smartphone. Um, any of those little blue lights, cover them with a little bit of tape or something. Try to make it as dark as you can. Get a good night's sleep, seven to eight hours, really important. Your health matters, your family matters, so stay healthy. We'll see you at the next video.